Robert Pritchett, Aaron Hanau, if you'll come. These are guys that have uh, been selected by our present deacons to be a part of the deacon mentoring program. Completed a year now, maybe a year and a little bit more. And uh, I think a flood, we had originally planned on doing this a little earlier, but the flood, Harvey had a different opinion of when we ought to do it. But here we are, praise the Lord. And these men have fulfilling the commission and the commitment to the deaconship and the deacon ministry that the Bible talks about in the book of Acts, Paul's letter to Timothy, and also in Titus. When he gives some strong qualifications for the heart and the desire of a man who desires this ministry of service to the church body. These guys love Jesus. That's the greatest thing they've got going for them. And they're committed to you, the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ here at Believer's Fellowship. So what we've had them do today is to come for the laying on of hands with ordination service. Behind them are two of their prayer partners, men that have ministered to them in this process, have been, had a ministry to them and been a blessing to them. They've invited. And then any other deacons would like to come and just stand behind at this time or any of our other ordained elders who would like to come and just stand behind them, feel free uh, to just come and they'll pray. But I want you guys to kneel there and you guys begin to pray for them. And as they begin to lift them up to the Lord and to pray for them, I would encourage you as well to realize this is an important ministry, an important call on, on a man's life to be a part of this in our church and to be praying for them and to lift them up as they commit themselves to this particular service. Each one of these men will be praying over them. In just a moment, I'll pray as well. But I'd ask you to join in for this time of prayer. You know these men and specifically pray for them, pray for their families and the ministry that God's called them to. Each one of these men is dedicated to Christ and just, not just to this ministry, but other ministries within our fellowship. Father, we realize the way that you have established and ordained and set up your body to function in the New Testament order you give us in Scripture. Lord, we at Believer's Fellowship are seeking to follow that as, as much as we humanly know how to do that. And Lord, as you call men and as the church selects men to fulfill this service of ministry, God, it's a, it's a great calling on their lives. And I'm asking you, Lord, as, as pastor of this fellowship, along with this whole body and these that are praying, that you would protect these men. Lord, we know that uh, when we take any position of leadership and service in a church, that the enemy immediately targets our lives. I want to thank you for each of these men's life, their testimony of love for you, their commitment to serve you, their desire to be used by you. Lord, what a blessing. But I pray you would fill them, encourage them, Stir up the gifts that you've given them to be used in service for you. And use them in the ministry to this fellowship and to this church. God, whatever particular service area they're called to, whatever particular ministry they fulfill, may they do it with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, body, and strength. And mostly, Father, they would do it to glorify you and to honor the precious name of your son, Jesus. We commit them, their service in this ministry, as well as to pray for them, as well as all our deacons and leadership in this body. May you be glorified in them and with them and through them. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Give these guys a hallelujah. <laughs> you men will, uh, that have prayed for them, if you'll take a moment to sign these ordination certificates. Talking to you guys at the front here. Turn around and look at me. <laughs> take a moment to sign these ordination certificates before, you're before they're seated. Amen. While they sign those certificates, let me just... Uh, Get back into a little bit of introduction of what we talked about last week and we'll be continuing this week as we're talking about how to break free from habitual sins. We mentioned last week that every one of us uh, struggle with certain things. We have propensity for certain issues, certain sins in, in, in life that uh, will probably, you know, bother you sometimes. I know you may struggle with something for the entirety of your Christian life, but it doesn't mean you're defeated and it doesn't mean you have to be defeated. Amen. Christ gives the victory. We just sang that song about, oh, the blood that gives me the victory. It'll, it does, it still does, and it, it's not ineffective today. It's not ineffective tomorrow. The blood still maintains the power we need to find forgiveness and grace and healing for whatever it is that we're dealing with in our life. So as we're dealing with habitual sins, I would say to you today, if there's something in your life that seems to have been plaguing you, something that's been kind of a consistent struggle in your heart and life, don't be afraid to deal with that in your life. You say, well, I've dealt with it before. I just hate to deal with it. I just keep failing. Hey, listen, there is, a, there is a path to freedom. And all too often in the midst of our failures, Satan loves to rub our face in our failure and tell us there's really no victory, there's no hope, and there's no deliverance. 
Well, I want you to know that there is in Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's the victory that we'll hold on to, and that's the victory we'll believe God for as we seek to serve him. Amen. All right. Tim, you're going to present these documents to these men real quick. Thank you, Joel. God bless you. Aaron, hallelujah. you come a long way, baby. <laughs> God bless you, Robert. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Last week, we talked about laying aside sin, and we kind of got into the beginning of that as we looked at that issue. But I want to talk today about, you know, more specifically, how do we lay aside sin? You'll have to do that for me because it's not working up here. How do we lay aside sin? I mean, when it comes to that issue. So that's part two of our, our message today. If you go to Hebrews chapter 12, it will be on the screen in a moment. You want to see if I've got it yet? Or is that you? Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I said last week, there's two key phrases I want you to focus on in this passage as we're talking about laying aside habitual sins. One is, we're, we're about to run the race. We're, we're about running the race. We're in a race. And the Bible says we should run that, your translation may say, with perseverance or endurance. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. The second phrase we looked at last week was, the sin which so easily entangles us. Remember, we are in a race, and this is not a little short-term jog. This is not a little get up and sprint around the block on the morning, feel a little bit better, get the blood circulating. This is a lifelong running race that we are involved in, and we are racing all the way to the end, and we're racing for the glory of God, and we're racing under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our life, and we're racing with our eyes set on Jesus Christ, and we're running for the glory of God. Amen? So let's remember that this is a race, and if it's a race, that means it's not over quickly. All right, this is your life. This is a pursuit. This is a journey that we're on. It's not a little quick sprint down the track and then we're all sitting down and watch somebody else run the race. So it is a long-term race. And if it's a long-term race, any long-distance runner will tell you, you don't need to run with a lot of weight on. You don't need to run carrying your garbage for the morning. You don't need to run with your baggage from the day before. You need to lay aside all the things that would so easily encumber you or would cripple you or would hinder you in the race. Now, I do believe as Christians, we carry things around that we shouldn't be carrying around any longer. We hold on to stuff we shouldn't be holding on to any longer. When the Bible says this, it, the, the truth will make you free and free indeed, it means we can be free indeed. And we all learn what that means. And whatever it takes for us to break free of the things that so easily entangle us, we ought to be about that. As I said, there will be things in your life that may bother you that may not bother me. There may be things that bug me and that become an habitual issue in my life that are not issues with you. I believe sometimes it depends on people's personality, the things that bug them, the things that would try to, to, to encumber their lives. Sometimes it depends on their past experiences. Always it will involve our old sin nature, habits that we develop. And remember we said last week, they're all creatures of habit anyway. Unfortunately, we're, you know, we, we get not only good habits, we get bad habits. And some of these things you've just habitually done over and over and over again. Your mind starts going a certain way. You automatically start following a certain path. We want to break that in your life. You want to see that dealt with in your life in such a way that when a thought comes, a desire comes, a temptation comes, it's not your first action to choose to do what you know is not God's will. It then becomes your first response to do what God's will is. We talked about sin a little bit last week and with the hope of giving us a little better understanding of the fight that we are fighting and the war we have to endure with. One, we said sin has great power over us. It's not a little thing. It easily entangles us, the scripture says. It doesn't take much sin to get a hold of our life. It is powerful. It's strong. It's a great force. And it seeks to exert its influence on our will, on our mind, on our emotions, on our affections, on our passions. Then we said also that sin easily will entangle us because it is so close. It's not like it's from the outside necessarily trying to press in. I wake up with it inside. It's part of my old nature. It dwells in my flesh, all right? It doesn't have to work its way in on me and knock the door down because it already is just kind of lingering, you know, in the, in the quiet part of my flesh life, and it's from within the battle comes. And the last thing we said last week was sin does not remain separate. 
but it seeks to mingle itself into everything, into my motives, into my actions. In fact, the Greek phrases it like this in the, in the Greek language. The sin which easily stands around us. It's near us. Why? Because it's within us. It doesn't remain separate. So he said, what we have to learn to do with this sin is learn how to do what the Bible says. Well, he makes it clear in, in, in verse 1. Therefore, let us lay aside these encumbrances. Let's lay them aside. We say, well, that's, that's good, good advice, but how do you do that? Let me give you about four simple points this morning that, that I think help clarify it. And we'll, this is two parts to this particular message. Give you about four today, and I'll give you about four next Sunday, because we can only take so much at one time. Amen? I give it to you all today, but you forget half of it before you go home. So let's just go with half of it. One, never underestimate the seriousness of your sin. I think often Christians have this terrible propensity to do that. We don't just see how serious sin is. We, we have a tendency in the time that we're rationalizing our sin to start justifying our sin, excusing our sin, and even minimizing it. And it's not such a big deal. Everybody else is doing it. It's not, it's, not, it, it's, it's not so bad. I remember one of the first sermons I heard after I gave my life to Jesus was a, was a message on Samson. And I don't remember who was preaching it, but uh, it had, he had three points that kind of hung with me. He said, sin, and he used Samson as obvious illustration, will always take you further than you want to go. Second point, sin will always cost you more than you want to pay. Third point, sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. If we could realize those three simple truths about sin, that it's going to take me farther away from God than I wanted to go. It's going to cost me more than I want to pay, and it's going to keep me longer than I want to stay. Maybe we wouldn't be so quick to jump to sin, to run to sin, or to link ourselves and our hearts up with sin. We have to deal firmly. We have to get serious about this issue of sin. And all too often, we're living in a culture that doesn't like to even use that particular three-letter word, sin. We don't like to bring it up. But we have to deal with the issue that is crippling us and that is hindering us and keeping us in an ineffective state in our Christian walk of life. So we don't want to, we don't want to underestimate what sin does in our life. Let me just give you a little list. And it wouldn't hurt perhaps to say, well, Brother Joe, here's my sin and make your own list. Sin steals my joy. Sin ruins my fellowship with God. Sin diminishes my ability to be a fruitful Christian. Sin robs me of peace with God. Sin renders my service for the Lord as useless. Sin mitigates against my effectiveness in reaching anybody else. Sin hinders my prayers from being answered. Sin brings discipline from God on my life because he loves me. Sin, it violates first, obviously, and foremost, my fellowship, we say relationship, but it affects it from the fact there's no fellowship being enjoyed in my relationship because sin is such an abhorrent thing to God himself because God is holy. It's amazing, you know, we can can get distressed about simple things in life and we can be upset about our calamities and depressed because of our miseries on but we never take time to realize maybe some of this misery and this calamity is due to the fact that I've got sin in my life that I'm just not willing to deal with and I just don't want to get rid of like John MacArthur's statement when he made this statement he says you know you need to treat your sins seriously it dishonors God it abuses mercy it despises grace it presumes on forgiveness it defiles worship service and fellowship It stains and taints and poison and destroys everything good and holy. Well, what a great statement. Wouldn't it do us well to sit back and realize for a moment, hey, this is what sin's doing in my life. This is what sin's doing in my marriage. This is what sin's doing to my my work. This is what sin's doing to my joy. And just get real honest about what it's doing in our hearts and life and no longer underestimate the, the, the effect that it's having upon us. But we have another route we go. Back in 2002, there was a story in the papers about a man who operated a crematorium by the name of Ray Brent Marsh. And uh, 
The story went that there was discovered some bodies in the woods, and as the authorities began to look closer at this discovery, they saw that this fellow had taken, who ran the crematory, he'd taken 200 bodies over a period of months and stacked them up in the woods and disposed of them there instead of cremating them. He told the authorities, my incinerator has not worked for some time. A spokesman for the company that made the incinerator that said the marshes had turned down several offers to service the unit, many offers that they'd been making to service as units since 1984. It's 2002. By the way, they said a two-year recommended service call, it cost about $795. The average cost to have a body cremated in 2002 was about $1,200 to a family. The operator cost to run the cremation for one body, about $25. What, what, what was the payoff for neglecting this little small expense in view of all the money that was being made? And he ends up now that it doesn't work and he's stacking bodies into the woods. I'm sure there was a point in time when he realized it's not working. He said, you know, I, I need to take care of that. I need to get that fixed ASAP. I'm going to get that dealt with. But he didn't. And he just keeps stacking bodies into the woods until there's 200 bodies hidden out in the woods. And what a disaster you have on your hand. And what sorrow and heartbreak to so many people who discover what's been going on with their loved ones. Here he is surrounded with a mountain of of bodies, corpses in the midst of his crisis. I got to think, and boy, that is so much like sin in our lives. We just carry that dead sin around and carry that. It's like Paul when he says in Romans, who will deliver me from this body of sin? (laughs) Instead of abandoning it, instead of laying it aside, instead of dealing with it and repentance and really getting honest and serious with God about deliverance in our life, we just kind of keep excusing and justifying and minimizing and rationalizing what we've, where we are, what we've done with what's going on in our life. And all too often for, we forget that Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And too often we forget that. Point one, never underestimate the power, the penalty, the cost of sin in your life. Point number two, This is important to strongly purpose and promise God not to sin. Say, hold it, hold it. I just know if I can do that because, you know, we're all going to sin. You know, we all just sin. We got to sin in nature. Listen, I think it's important that you realize just how much God wants you to be free. Why is it that when it came to the place of giving your life to Jesus, you didn't have a problem? I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. But then when it comes to doing it, it becomes another thing. The people who succeed in their Christian walk and the people who I know that I consider holy people who are really walking with God, they're the people who've made strong commitments to the Lord. Unashamed, unafraid, doesn't mean they're perfect, but they've made some powerful commitments. And I think you have to come to this place where it's it's a simple prayer of commitment that says, Lord, I take this solemn pledge. I mean, it's a vow before you. I do not want to sin. I do not want to break your law. I don't want to grieve your spirit. I don't want to dishonor your son, Jesus, and his name that that I bear. So I'm committing my life to you. So I just don't know about that. You don't know about that because there's something inside us called our sin nature that kind of burrs up its neck and says, oh, nobody's perfect. I just don't want to do that. Well, the scriptures are full of great men and women of God who made that kind of pledge to God. David put it this way, and he said, listen, I have sworn, and I will confirm it, that I will keep your righteous ordinances. That's pretty powerful, is it not? But I think that's what it takes in our lives to really get serious about what God's doing in our life. And unless we're willing to make that kind of resolution, you're going to find it easily to be entangled by the sin that surrounds you on every side. It's that kind of heart purpose, that kind of holy vow unto the Lord that is at the root of genuine living for Jesus anyway. It's a matter of getting absolutely serious to make that kind of conscious commitment to the Lord and say, I know I'm going to battle these things in my life. I know I'm going to be oppressed by this. And I know there may be times my life fall flat on my face, but I want you to know I'm moving on. And when I fall, I'm getting up, confessing it and moving forward. I'm leaving it behind. See what God does in your life. Now, it's not just to say I'm going to make a pledge. I believe it's based with one thing that we all too often leave out. The Bible says the just shall live by faith, right? 
This is a faith pledge. This is a faith commitment. This says, I trust God. God told me to repent, so I'm repenting. God told me to live for him, so I'm living for him. And the Bible says, for with the heart, a man believes unto righteousness. So there's a heart commitment. You say, well, where's the vow come in and the words come in? The Bible says, with the heart, a man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In other words, there's, a, there's not only just a heart belief in this action of living a holy life, there's a verbal commitment. There's a standing up. It's, it's like you now become, I know it's a tough word for folks, accountable. I'm accountable to God. And somehow do I think that if I don't do it, I won't be accountable? <laughs> I'm accountable to God anyway. I'm, I'm going to stand before the Lord on all these things. So it comes to place saying, Lord, I'm going to run your race for your glory. And I'm going to be what you called me to be. And you're going to give me what I need to make it. I mean, we'll see as we go through these eight points all together, the, the, the involvement of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life the promises of God's word in our life, the trust in God's presence in our life, all those things play a part in. David put it this way. He said in the same chapter 119, in verse 32, he says, I shall run the way of thy commandments, for thou wilt enlarge my heart. Now, I thought this passage was interesting back when a year and a half or so ago when Kathy was going, really for three years, she went through it before we finally had surgery about a year and a half ago, for her heart. Doctors kept telling us over and over that the affibulation, whatever the medical terms are for that racing heart thing that she was going through, had, had caused her heart to come, become enlarged. In fact, her heart had gotten so bad in, in racing, it'd get to three or 400 beats a minute at one time. And because of it, she already had leaky valves in her heart, but this was creating a, a greater leak of the valves because the heart was enlarging. And of course, where the valves come off the heart, now there's greater leaks that are there because the heart's increasing in size. Now, a marathon runner will have an enlarged heart. In fact, he told her, your heart looks like you're a marathon runner. Now, that's all right for a marathon runner because that's been done in the proper way over a period of time. And a marathon runner has to have a heart that's a little bit enlarged because it has to pump a lot of blood to keep that marathon runner running the distance and the time that it takes to run the marathon, providing the oxygen and all that goes into to delivering the necessary things to the muscles to keep moving with that kind of endurance. But for someone in that kind of situation, it's not a good thing. But listen to what David says. I'll run the way of your commandments and you will enlarge my heart. What's he saying? I'm going to make this commitment to you and I'm, I'm firing out of, the, out of the starting blocks and I'm running for you and I'm running to you and I'm running for you and you're going to do with me what needs to be done. You're going to give me what I need. You're going to sustain me. You're going to provide for me. But hey, what happens if I never make that kind of commitment? This, nothing's ever going to happen in your life. The people who do great things for God are the people who make big, grand commitments to God. But those who are afraid of stating those kind of statements in their life, then they never accomplish anything for God. I've had that discussion with many people before who said, you know, I just don't know about making a vow to the Lord because the Bible says, you know, it's better not to make a vow and break it. Well, yeah, but it doesn't say don't make a vow. It's encouraging to make the vow and keep it. So we make a vow unto the Lord that we keep, and it's our intention to keep. It's our passion to keep. It's my desire to keep it, and I start moving on from there. And God, I believe at that point, begins to enter into my heart and life, to enlarge my heart, and with a whole new attitude of faith and commitment to him, it begins to move forward the way it's supposed to move forward in my life, and he gives me the enlarged heart that I need. But if I'm just content to sit down, well, I'm just going to have to deal with this. You know, my daddy dealt with this, and my mama was this way, and on and on. We make every excuse for being that kind of person that's immature and disobedient to the Lord in our life, and we somehow justify it in our mind, then we don't see God do what he desires to really do in our life. And we become not victors in life, we become victims. Victims of our own failures and victims of our own defeat. And we lose instead of win. And we don't gain, we, we, we drop out. But we have to get serious about this issue of sin. See, there's a difference between we said where sin's dwelling in us and then sin entertained by us. So we said it's near. But just because it's near, I'm not going to be best friends. Just because I'm familiar with it doesn't mean I'm going to hold on to it because there is a difference between sin remaining 
And sin that is harbored or sin that is preserved and held on to. So to lay aside this sin, which so easily besets me, means just first and foremost, when I realize how serious it is, and secondarily, I, I, I purpose and promise God to obey. I make a firm commitment to him. I promise you, Lord, I'm going to obey you here. It brings about a whole new responsibility to your mind to realize how important it is that you serve the Lord in honorable ways. It brings a whole new power to the way you're living your life because you realize there is an accountability and you love God and you want to honor God. And now when this thing begins to rise up, also what begins to rise up is your promise you made. Third part of this is be suspicious of your own spirituality. Paul said it this way, you know, beware. The person who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. About the time we get arrogant because we've accomplished something, it's about the time we usually fall flat on our face. Amen. Amen. You say, how do you know? I've been there multiple times. (laughs) I've got my degree in this. (laughs) About the time you think you're spiritual, be careful. You're going to find out how quick you are. not Beware. Take heed. Be, be, Be on guard, the Bible tells us, to be vigilant with your thought life. Job put it this way in regard to having this issue of morality in his life. And he said, put it there, Job 31, I've made a cup of my eyes. How then can I gaze upon a virgin? A maiden. Why should I look at a young woman? Why? Because I made a covenant with my eyes. Here's Job making promises to his eyeballs. We're going to agree with me and my eyes are going to get together on this deal. I know my temptation. I know where this will lead me in my mind. I know where this is going to take me. So right here, right now, I'm having an agreement and a covenant made with my eyes that I'm not going to gaze upon a maiden. So Brother Joe, I mean, that's nice to say, but they're everywhere. You can't turn on the TV. You can't go down the street. You can't see the billboard. It's just everywhere. Well, I'll tell you what my mama told me. No, son, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. I'm sure somebody said that long before her. So shake the nest out. Don't let them build a place in your life and in your heart and in your mind. Make a decision with your heart and decide, you know, there's no place where I'm going to be so spiritual that this is not going to be a a bother to me eventually. Proverbs 4, 23 says, watch over your heart, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of your life. Guard your mind, guard your heart. There's a certain watchfulness that takes place for the person who's going to be the victor in life, that he's aware of the the subtlety of sin and how it moves in his heart and how how it moves, especially in times when we think we're so spiritual. Remember Elijah just seen a great moment of God, revival break loose on Mount Horeb and all the false prophets are slayed and he's all excited about his life and his ministry and he gets back to town and within 24 hours he's running for his life. It's amazing. I think sometimes we think that we're just going to get so spiritual that our flesh won't bother us anymore. Well, good luck with that. That's not going to happen. I stated it last week. I should state it again in case you weren't here. There's nothing ever going to improve with your flesh. Never. Your flesh, you can dress it up. You can teach it all the Bible verses. You can teach it all the Bible words. You can take your flesh to church every Sunday of the week. You can go on Wednesday, not miss lift or anything else, but your flesh just remains your flesh. You're growing in grace. This new person, you are in Christ Jesus, but it will always stand in opposition to the flesh. It's always going to be there. Be suspicious of your own spirituality. Be suspicious of a kind of a spiritual satisfaction in life. It's like this this fly one day. He's flying along. He's enjoying his life, and he sees as a lawnmower. He says, I think I'm going to take my little rest on the the handle of the lawnmower. He, He settles in, and he lands right on the lawnmower's handle. And he's really enjoying himself. It's a beautiful day. The kids are getting on the bus, going to school. And he's excited watching all the children get on the bus. And he notices that one young child, as he's playing with the other kids, their sandwich falls out of their lunch bag and onto the sidewalk. Kids don't notice. They all get on the bus and they're on the way. But all he can see is that sandwich. And it's laying open. And there's a big old slice of bologna. Y'all know the story? Well, the fly is just overcome by the temptation for the bologna. And finally just said, this is, this is, this has got to be heaven. He flies down, starts tearing up the bologna as fast and furious, as hard as he can. He just, you know how flies (laughs) are. He just eats himself so fully he can barely move. He's like, I just can't take it anymore. And he struggles and 
flaps his little wings and finally makes his way back up to the lawnmower handle and sits down. And the baloney begins to swell. He said, well, that's great baloney. And he's looking at it and it's still there. That's a whole lot of baloney for one fly to eat. But he thinks he can. And he stares at the more he stares at it, he says, I gotta go back. But I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can get off this handle. I can do it. He stretches out his wings, steps off the handle, and <laughs> falls flat on the ground, splats all over the sidewalk. Dead. That's a horrible story, I know. <laughs> but the moral of the story is this: don't fly off the handle when you're full of baloney. And the same thing is true in your spiritual life. There may be some baloney still on the sidewalk, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to go eat it. Sin is always present, but it doesn't mean that you have to participate in it. Humanity's kind of like that fly, so full of baloney sometimes, so full of our own spirituality, so to say. We're so spiritual, it's not going to affect us, or we can handle it when all the time we're getting ready to head for a wreck in our life. It's like a subtle seduction of your mind and your heart. And that will arise many times out of those moments of your supposed spirituality when everything seems so right. Be suspicious of your own spirituality. Don't trust it. Understand except for the grace of God, you will crash and burn. You will go and do. Be careful the person who falls and stumbles in front of you that you're not there to carry them and help them and pray for them because you could be that person the next time. Well, I couldn't be that person. You know how far I've come with God. You don't know how close you are to sin at all times. One little millimeter, centimeter, one little hair away from the cross of Jesus Christ and reliance upon his word and his spirit, you'll be just as fallible as everybody else is. You have to stay in Christ. And the last is this, the fourth. Resist the first risings and the promptings of your flesh and pleasure. How? You submit your thoughts and your ideas and those feelings in that moment to Christ. Not later, not halfway down the road, but it's the first, first ideas. The Apostle Paul said, we pull down every stronghold that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring into captivity every thought. That means when temptation comes, and they come regularly, that it's at that beginning moment that you deal with it. It's there, right there, right then, in that moment, you deal with it by taking it into captivity. He said, I know where that's going to lead. I'm bringing it to Jesus. And I'm putting my mind, not on that, I'm putting my mind on Christ and upon his will and upon his word to my life. That's where I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to go. That's where I'm going to live. You know, y'all remember the old show, Hee Haw? Some of you are old enough to remember that. Some of you have to go Google it. I don't remember what would come up with that. Remember Doc Campbell on Hee Haw? You old folks do, right? People always come into Doc Campbell. He always had a funny line for everybody. He's confronted by one of the patients on the show. He says, I broke my arm in two places. Doc Campbell says, well, don't go into them places. (laughs) Some of you are complaining about your catastrophe in your life and your spiritual life. It's time to quit going to that place. Don't go there. Don't entertain that. If you're on a diet, you can't stare at the refrigerator, Right? (laughs) Whatever that refrigerator might be, whatever that sin might be, whatever that that stronghold has been in your life, then you don't entertain that. You don't go near that. You don't flip that channel on the TV. You don't go to that place in in your mind. You just resist it. You, You have to deal with it. James put it this way when he made this statement. He said, listen, each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. That's King James. It literally is the terminology for desire. Whatever the desire might be. That's when you're tempted, when, it's, when it comes up. It's, and then if you entertain it, so to say, if it becomes where your thoughts are going to go, then it will be conceived and it will give birth to sin. And sin, when it is accomplished, be sure it always leads to death. It always leads to separation. It always leads to pain. When lust is conceived, when the desire is acted upon, it gives birth to sin. So what do you do? You want to stop the sin at the point of the conception, when it's in your mind. The first, the first idea of it, not at the point of birth. You can't try to have an abortion with it later. You have to stop it right then and there by submitting it to Christ Jesus. At its conception, 
not after it's been conceived, not after it's run through some sort of pregnancy in your life and mine, but you stop it in the moment, you stop it there, you stop it now, you don't wait till later to stop it. You always have to remember at the very outset, my goal is not to please myself, my goal is to please the Lord, right? So if it's our goal to please the Lord, when those thoughts come into my mind that are contrary to what would please the Lord, then it's time to do something about it. And it's not to turn the Lord off, switch the channel over to the desire and focus in on that. It's just the opposite of that. You flip that channel off. You turn that signal off by doing what? Well, you can't do two things at once. What do you mean? The Bible says, if you don't walk in the flesh, you won't fulfill his desires. What's that mean? Galatians says, if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. So what, means, what am I going to do? I'm going to respond to the flesh and I'll walk in that and go that path. Or will I take that thing or whatever it might be, submit it to God and say, I'm going to walk in the spirit here. Because if I walk in the spirit, I can't do that. It's impossible. I can't do it. I can't, I can't be right here in this pulpit at the very same time I'm in the pulpit in Magnolia. It's impossible. I know some of you are trying to be cute. Well, well if we do live streaming. <laughs> We're talking about reality here, all right? Physically, in two places. Right. You can't be in the spirit and in the flesh at the same time. So the best thing to do is make the choice for the life of the spirit. To trust the Lord. To say, my thoughts are no longer going to go this way. And you're not, here's what most people do, though. It's just like this. They stay over here with full intentions of getting into the walk with the spirit. But they just stay there. And here's how they do it. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to think about that. You can't make me think about that. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not, not going to think about that. And all you're thinking about is that. <laughs> you're just stuck on that. Quit deliberating. Quit playing that mind game and say, I'm going to think about Jesus. Amen. I'm going to think about his word. And I say next week we'll talk about the power of the promises of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and reliance upon the Holy Spirit. How it literally releases is God's grace in your life and what God will do with your life when you make that choice. But the best news of all is, according to Romans 6, you no longer are a slave to sin. You don't have to stay over here any longer. So it's time to make a decision. It's time to make a decision. How am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And what am I going to deal with this habitual thing that's going on in my life? Some it's been years. Some it's just been months. Some it's been a long time. Sometimes you say, well, you know, that's a good sermon for drug addicts. It's a good sermon for gossips. It's a good sermon for people who always have a negative response in life. Yes. Always go to the negative. No matter what, it's just negative, 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 negative. It's, it's, it's for any sin. So don't try to push that off on your neighbors. <laughs> Say, God, search me. See if there be any habitual harmful way in me. Because yes. I want to live for you. Yes. And I want my life to mean something for your glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed.